those kind of things help the organization to some degree. But a lot of organizations are looking a little too much for the, you know, what's the ROI on this position? Yeah. Did he save us from three mistakes? Well, how would you know that? Did he boost our sales by 10%? No, you need to understand the nature of the work, how it fits in with helping the organization. That's the art side, right? How it fits in with helping the organization be a better, stronger organization. And then you make the assessment, you know, that's really worthwhile. And so it has to be that kind of, what I used to do was I used to ask the project managers. So this is what I told my boss after I was there. First year I was there, I, I, he asked me, uh, what are you going to do in your first year's goals? Like you need performance goals. Okay. Well, what are you going to do for knowledge management? You know, chief knowledge officer, what's your performance goal? So I told him uh, two things. There's seven directors, director and six direct reports. I said, they'll all know me on a first name basis. He said, okay. <laughs> Number two, I said, project managers, who are the kings in NASA, they run the projects, right? They're the heads yeah. of all the projects. Project managers will call me and ask for assistance. Well, Now, these were both sort of out there. Big goals. Big goals, because what nobody knows all the directors on a first name basis, except the director <laughs> probably, right? A few people at the top. And by the way, project managers never call for the assistance from quality or safety or human resource if they don't need it, right? Yeah. They don't call over and say, just send over some extra people to my <laughs> team to kind of muck up things. But they did. I went to him and I went to his office before the year was out and I said, you tell me all the directors, do any of them not know me on a first name basis? He goes, no, you're right. They all know you. Because I've put my fingers in all the projects and made a difference. So they know me. Not in a sense I want to get rid of you. They know me as like, you know, if they see me coming, they'll talk to me. Sure. And project manager, I took him emails of a project manager called me up and said, I need you to come help me with my project. That must be a good feeling. So that was a good feeling. <laughs> but I made those up on the spot. It was a little risky. <laughs> <laughs> but still, it paid off. It paid off. It but I'm, paid off. I'm also willing to take risks, you know. And I thought they were serious, so I was serious about going all in. Uh, so before we move on to some of the fun stuff, I, I just have one question because you, you've had, again, a very diverse career because you started in agronomy, and then you moved on to international business, and then you moved on to a uh, you know human resource management, someone in that space, and then you ended up as chief knowledge officer at NASA. Mm -hmm. What were some of the challenges associated? Because you know a lot of people who are here at Masters Union as well, for them, they, they would love to his, listen to that answer because uh, we're in a space wherein we may have had careers in in you know one particular vertical, and now we're strictly looking to jump industries. You know, someone is maybe coming in as a consultant, but now wants to move on to marketing or the other way around. What was the challenge like? And how, so, how did you sort of navigate through that process? So I could tell you a nice story of how I strategically planned my life and made very <laughs> smart choices and had all the, all the things worked out in advance and was in complete control of everything, but that wouldn't be true. But it would sound nice. But it wouldn't help you either. A lot of those choices were made, there were some that we made inten very intentionally. So my wife and I, when we first got married, we wanted to go give back. We were very committed to go helping people with what we wanted to do. So we went off to Lebanon to be missionaries for five years, helping people in the war. Wow. And we helped the most bombed out people. And I mean, it was, but it's a wonderful experience. I wouldn't change it for anything. I mean, it was the most satisfying, you know, part of years of my life, but it was crazy. I mean, people were killed and our colleagues were shot. People were blown up. People were kidnapped. People I knew and worked with, they didn't come back the next day, their legs are blown off. I mean. It was a horrible situation, but you're making some difference. I don't think there isn't a person alive who doesn't want to make a difference if they can. And because I was looked at it as I was given an opportunity to make a difference, and I think all I did was step up to it. But we were evacuated. We were kicked out. So I ended up in the U.S. penniless, jobless, and no skills. I mean, I can hand out fl blankets. Oh. I learned how to hang out blankets. That was my skill. Like, what am I doing? Drive a truck. So I had to make some choices. So a lot of these choices were thrust upon us. So I took, my brother advised me to go get an MBA. He said, why don't you go get an MBA? And what he said is, I think you're good at solving problems, Ed. You seem to be good at solving problems. My father was a physicist. Yeah. He used to always teach us to solve problems and figure things out. So if something's broken, a toy's broken, he like get down and take it apart and help us figure out how to fix it, not just go buy a new one. So we learned from an early age, you can fix things. Yeah. So we have this problem solving attack on life. And so I thank him for that. And so I did, I went to get an MBA, I loved it. I had never studied any business. As you said, my undergrad degree was in agriculture. Yeah. That was interesting to me. And I majored in Arabic. I studied Arabic language and agriculture. But, you know, so what? Then I went off and did business. I found it fascinating. Then I went off and did some, I was older student at the time when I got my MBA. So yeah. all my classmates got placed. 
I got no placement. So what happened? So I went off and did consulting. Isn't that what you do when you're, consul you're consulting when you don't, have, you don't get a placement? It was a really bad year. It was also the economy was down. The jobs were really bad in general. This is around 1990, right? Yeah, 1991. 1991. Yeah, 1991. So it was, a, it was a really bad year. The market was way off. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I was the marginal person, the older, bit older student and stuff like that. And so I didn't, I didn't get an offer from the, after my MBA. Which, okay, so I went and did something else. So I went and did consulting. I ended up consulting with senior people at Procter & Gamble. Wow. Yeah, so I mean, how did that happen? Well, you just, you do what's in front of you. You know, I did some menial things. I did some other things. I found some work and you get an opportunity. And if you're ready for it, you know, opportunity comes to those who are looking and those who are moving. I do believe that. I never stopped moving. Even though there were some obstacles put in my way or some blocks and said, you can't go straight, you can go left or right. So I, made, I don't sit there and didn't scratch my head, said, I'll go left. <laughs> and you move. And so you move ahead and you make the best of it. And the person who didn't get placement in 1991, 10 years later, would find himself with a job as chief knowledge officer at NASA. Absolutely. So it all worked out. It works out. It worked out very well. And we're glad to have you here with us today as well. Um, but... So now let's, let's talk about the more fun aspects, because we've had a lot of discussion about, you know, Master's Union, the course and this thing. I want to get to know you better as a person and for okay. our audience to get to know you better as a person. Sure. I know music's played a very, very important role in your life. You play three instruments, if I'm not wrong. You play the guitar, you play piano as well. And of course, you learn to play saxophone at 58. <laughs> uh, where did this love exactly come from? And did, did this love for music sort of help you in your professional pursuits as well? So I really, that belongs to my parents. They're both musicians. Oh. They performed in orchestra, violin and cello. And music was always an important part of our family. Musical, singing, just not professional, like in plays and not necessarily, but always fun. It was always a part of the family. We loved to sing and do things. And so I always loved music. Um, I, I didn't have a bad, you know, bad musical aptitude. I'm not a genius, you know, natural super talent or anything like that, but I'm good enough to play along, get along. Um, I did study some as a young you know, child, but I didn't pursue any of them really very strongly. Uh, in high school, I learned how to play classical guitar. So I studied very, very ferociously and performed classical guitar when I finished high school. I was performing classical guitar pieces at that level. you know. But I went off to college and didn't even have a guitar. So it took a, took a, took a back seat. And uh, so uh, I passed along and uh, I sang. I sang a lot in church, you know, things like that, just yeah. for so social reasons and stuff. And uh, then I later learned to play an accordion. Oh. <laughs> Just again, hacking around, you know. And uh, I play for my kids and my grandkids. Now they like that. They like playing around, like silly. And then I learned to play piano on my own all along the way. Just sitting down and playing every day for a few minutes. Beyond just music, uh, travel has, has, been a, has been something that's been very important to you. Uh, I think you grew up in Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and you had your high school in India as well. Where was that exactly coming in from? Was it family that was taking you places? And even since then, you know, what, what has, how important has travel been to you? So I've always enjoyed traveling. My family traveled ever since I was eight years old. We, as you said, we moved from U.S. in 1966 okay. to Saudi Arabia. And my parents lived there for about a dozen years. Wow. So I basically grew up there as a young child in the local school. It was an American school for the expats, you know. Yeah. And then high school time, I was sent to boarding school, as you said, in Kodi Canal. Yeah. Southern, in Southern India, which was, which was just wonderful. I mean, you know, explore the country. We used to ride trains all over the countryside, take trips to Cochin and Bangalore, <laughs> Madurai, Trincomalee, all these places. We visit all these places. So you must have some great travel stories from oh, India. Oh, yeah. We had a lot of good stories. I mean, uh, right, we used to always, so when we used to book trains, <laughs> we used to try to book the steam engine trains, okay. even if they're slower. <laughs> Even if they took 24 hours, we just sit on the train. We used to have lots of fun because we're just going for the journey. So you ride around on a steam engine train in third class for a couple of days. You kind of feel like Gandhi's experience. <laughs> you really sure. saw India. Oh, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure with these with these experiences in India as well. And you've been in India a lot. You know, you've been here a lot of times. Uh, yes. You've had a lot of exposure to Indian cinema as well, Bollywood. And I know it's kind of been a dream for Piyas to be in a Bollywood movie someday. <laughs> so uh, what's your favorite Bollywood movie? And, and when did you first get sort of exposure to Indian cinema? Well, we watched movies when we were in high school, right? Yeah. In the 70s. Of course, that time it was Zina Taman and all these others. She was big in Hari Krishna, Hari Rama and other movies like that in those days. I don't remember too many of them, but uh, <laughs> we saw those kind of movies back in those days. We didn't understand all of them very much. Uh, the language as much, but you could follow along what's happening. Yeah. 
Um, but I've always enjoyed watching uh, different Bollywood movies. Obviously, you know, watching a lot of SRK's movies and things like that. And and uh, my wife and I uh, like to watch Bride and Prejudice. You know, those Aishwarya Rai's movies. It's so good. <laughs> I mean, they're so funny. They have a really good take on life, and they're, they're light. You know, they have a lightness about humor of like, laugh at ourselves in our in our silliness. And you know, I showed some clips from Three Idiots in the yeah. in the classroom and from Mumbai and from other films. Mm -hmm.